Hello to everyone. Fair enough. I can do this in, in 15 or 45 or 30. Uh, it, it really just depends how much time we spend in the repo. So uh, let me just make sure, speaking of, that I've not going to, that I have it open and split my tabs without anything blowing up. Great. Perfect. Um, let's focus on uh what DSC is actually, actually, you know, I, I see a lot of people in the chat, at least, who I know are very familiar with DSC already. Um, <laughs> I see Rob is saying uh, no one's up after me, so it takes as much time as I want. That's all right. We'll stick to around, you know, 45 minutes ish. Um, can I just get within the chat uh, one through five on, on if you were to g give yourself a scale? where one is like, I barely know how to spell DSC. And five is like, I feel comfortable going to most organizations and implementing config as code. Three is like, I've tried it. And then you can use your own imagination and define two and four as you want. So five is more experienced, one is not. Help me understand where we would like to dig in. I appreciate all the responses. I see a variety. I just came from a statistics course all morning, so I could I could uh, create a probability equation and figure out where we're at. Um, okay, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to start off by explaining a little bit of what configuration as code is. Um, to the, a point that Alexander was making whenever I first joined the chat. Uh, there's almost nothing in common when we look at what DSC version 3 is with the original DSC, uh, although it's very compatible with the original DSC. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what the new DSC version 3 is, where you'll see it, kind of how you'll see it, um, how to find information in the repo, and then we're going to dig into what things look like. Uh, so for everybody who's kind of new to configuration as code and getting started, we'll start off some of these couple of slides, there's only two, uh, three maybe, will seem very familiar if you've seen DSC presentations before. Some of these are borrowed from TechEd 2013. So DSC is right around 10 years old. Um, I don't think it was like really in the world too much until probably 2014. So we could say it's 10 years old, I guess. Um, Many people who are looking at configuration as code for the first time say, what is this and why should I care? And so, and I would say everybody probably who's attending uh, the Minicon is familiar with scripting. And in this case, you know, using ISE as an editor. Nobody is gonna, nobody's gonna chime in here that I put ISE on the screen. <laughs> Uh, so you know, this would be referred to as imperative code scripting um, or, or any combination of those three terms. Uh, so the idea is you're open your editor and you're writing scripts. And most scripts we think about, um, you probably are thinking about it sort of chronologically as you're, as you're working through it. So it's like it has a beginning and an end and you're working your way through and it's divided into functions and it becomes modular, but uh, somebody still use ISC. Uh, but you think about it as you're writing the script and you're going to run through that script and that becomes a completion. And you can think about this even as something like a... Um, if you've built servers in the past, right? Uh, so, you know, for those of us who have been around for a long, long time, you might even remember whenever you ordered the hardware and it showed up in the data center and you rack mounted it and you put the DVD in the drive and you boot it up. And, you know, now it's a VM, but you still might remote desktop into it. You don't have a KVM switch anymore, um, depending on your environment. But the whole idea was, you know, for a long time, the way we built servers was literally a document. Like you had a document that said the way we build file servers is, and you just went section by section, paragraph by paragraph, and that was how you built the server. And hopefully you clicked on the right things. Um, because if you didn't, you ended up with every server being a little bit different. And some of you have probably lived through that pain. And so, um, you know, as things moved forward, a lot of people now use automation to build servers. But if you think about that in the imperative scripting sense, that means you've just written a script. 
you run it on the server, it builds it out, um, and it's sort of like just runs through the script. Uh, and I think the biggest fear, and I run into this all the time still, um, that people have whenever they get into that situation is, what if I ever need to change that script? Like, what if tomorrow we are going to switch from a old version of an app to a new version of an app, or we're going to change from one storage array to another? How likely is it that my whole script, my server build process is going to continue to work when changes come? Um, so configuration as code helps us to address that. And the way that this was originally put forth, and I love this concept and we're just going to keep it, uh, is you think about the way things happened on Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> so Captain Picard is in charge. He knows what he wants. And he says, let's go to this planet. Number one, make it so. And number one, just did it. Right? He didn't explain, okay, what we're going to do is plot a course. We're going to go this speed. We got this distance. We expect to get there when he just said, do it. Great. That's what I'll do. So that's a little bit of the concept. Never mind that it says Microsoft Confidential. I just stole the background of the slide. I didn't, uh, I didn't steal the whole slide. This slide is, is quite public at this point. Uh, so the idea behind this is um, if you look at the item potent concept, you might have done something like, I want to do get Windows feature. And if it's, uh, if it's there, great. If it's not, I want to install it, right? And go through a list of feature names. Um, and you can imagine, like, this was originally an internal-only slide. That's how old DSC is. Uh, so that's kind of funny. I didn't notice that text was across the bottom. Um, by contrast, if you're thinking about it in terms of configuration as code, you want to see a structure like what you see over here where it says Windows Feature IIS. Um, so the idea is you, what, what, if you were to hand off your server build script to somebody else, Instead of them having to sort of go, okay, I see what you're doing here. You're going parallel through each feature. You're checking to see if it's installed. If not, you're going to run it. Great. You just say, I want Windows features. And I expect the one named Windows Server to be present. Um, that is the most basic concept of configuration as code. And we could spend the full 45 minutes thinking just about um, best practices and things like that. But this is where configuration as code kind of came from. So if, if, you're, um, if you're grasping that concept that we're moving from this bottom square to this middle square, that is the concept of configuration as code. And of course, when we talked a little bit about what happens when you change it, imagine that you go to source control and you say that this line number, you know, let's say one, two, three, or zero, one, two, depending on how you like to count, um, is now ensure equals absent. Or name is web dash server dash two or something you can now go back and look at your source control and look at the commit that came in see that came from michael green he put a comment in as to why he was doing that it may be broken but we know how to roll it back and we know why it broke and who broke it and when it broke and if you have tests on top of this you can even run it through a pipeline and have validation of the of your uh, script looking at these things and saying, let's go try it on a VM before we roll it out into production and, and kind of creating a safety net. So the idea is that you eliminate that fear of what's going to happen when I change it. Um, and at least that's that's where we want to get to, right? And it's uh, been a long, long journey thinking about these things. So what is DSCB3 and why are, why are we working on it? What are we trying to solve? My next slide is uh, is animated, so I guess I got to hit the buttons and I have it start uh, doing a full screen share. Um, but as far as the agenda, we're going to go through what is it trying to solve? We're going to take a look at the, the actual schema files in DSCB3, like where to find them. Um, Mikey Lombardi has done a great job actually developing real JSON schema for DSCB3 so that just like an API, you can go see what things are and how they're supposed to work, um, which has been really, really fascinating to watch. We're going to take a look at what does a, a configuration look like now, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we think it'll look like uh, down the road. And then we're going to take a look at um, resources and do a little bit of demo uh, at the command line. Although at this point, we're just getting to the point where uh, DSC at the command line is interesting to start playing with again. Um, there's a lot more fun to be had in the repo. So, oh, it goes to the other monitor. That's not cool. <laughs>
What if I do the one within the screen? Well, that's okay. We're just gonna not have animations. Here we go. So what problems are we trying to solve with V3? This is some of the most interesting stuff to dig in in the repo. Uh, number one, DSC V3 is all written in Rust. So it is, uh, it, it truly is cross-platform, meaning that it compiles for Windows, it compiles for Linux, uh, and, and you can compile it, I believe, still and run it on a Mac. Um, we, the goal was to eliminate the dependency on WMI and WinRM and SIM. So originally, DSC worked a lot through WinRM. And as you were going through and looking at um, how the data was organized underneath DSC, uh, that was very reliant upon SIM models. And that's why whenever you uh, created a configuration, you wrote it in PowerShell, you ran the configuration keyword to compile it, and that created a MOF, which I believe is Managed Object Framework. You might check me on that. Um, or Managed Object Format, I think is right. Uh, it, MOF is very, very machine readable. It is quite verbose and organized much the way that WMI data models are organized. Not the friendliest for uh, a human to open and read. Certainly as things like cloud native has come along and we see more things happening in JSON and YAML, MOF just more and more when you open it is like, how in the world did we ever land on this, right? But it made sense whenever everything was organized around WMI. Um, but of course, moving away from WMI is not a painless shift. There's going to be baggage with any big change. WMI provide a lot of things under the covers, um, such as ways to handle um, complex objects and credentials and things like that. So uh, a lot of things would have to be re-implemented, and Steve's done a great job working through those. Um, let's go on to the second goal, which was something that I've really been trying to figure out for a long time. Um, so PowerShell DSC in Windows, your resources, which were the things that in the, in the uh, Star Trek scenario where Captain Picard says, just do it, and then number one says, I'll go take care of all the complexity. All the complexity happens in your resource. So back in that example, when it said Windows Server, Web Server, or sorry, Windows Feature, Web Server, present, Windows Feature would be your resource. And within that, you have this very structured um, method of laying out your script where there's a get, a set, and a test. And that language is very familiar to people in the DSC community. Get, set, and test. Um, the whole idea was I want to get the current state. Is, is this a web server right now? Is that feature installed? Set would mean make it a web server, or if you set ensure absent, make it not a web server. And then, of course, test was check and see if it's a web server. Right? That's the basics of uh, what a resource is. So for Linux, um, there, there was a DSC for Linux in version one. Uh, it was very, very limited, and the resources were mostly written in C. Uh, worked well. Um, was written for a very specific set of things, and never got any community traction as far as building out additional resources because not a lot of people wanted to write resources in C. Um, so the question has always been, well, why can't we just write link resources in any language? Um, in order to do that, we would have to really decouple the execution of the resource from the way that we call it. And so that creates some interesting opportunities. And of course, moving away from WMI and therefore not having any MOF also means that if you've written a DSC resource, you might remember having to create the schema.moth file for the resource, which was literally like, here are the properties that it will accept as input and their type and the explanation for each one. And then if you get into embedded classes and things like that, it got more complicated. If you're moving away from WMI, no schema.moth file. So how do we handle that? Um, there's no concept uh, today in DSC v1 and v2 of grouping things together. So what would it mean to say, I want to do a Windows feature, I want to do um, make it a web server and then put this content on the file system to be my web page, make that a group, and then go on and say, oh, and I want to do uh, some certificate and TLS type information, make that a group, and like all of group one has to complete before group two can start and things like that. That doesn't really exist um, in V1. You can do a little bit um, of that kind of stuff, but not, not very uh, elegantly. 
Um, there's also I put resource IO. There's no concept either within uh, across resources, and since there's no grouping within groups or across groups, there's no concept of uh, having information output of a resource and input into another. And the classic example here has always been, I want to install SQL, and then I want to install IIS. Uh, I load up the code for my web app um, on my web server, and I need to tell it how to connect to my database, but I don't know that un exactly if I'm in a very fluid and dynamic environment until the database's uh, server has been built out. And now I'll know the host name and the full connection string and all that kind of stuff. Um, just wasn't a way to do that. So this whole concept of passing information from one another um, was a big thing that we wanted to figure out. There's never been a concept of pre-flight checks, except unless you wrote it yourself. Um, so the idea was, before I make this thing a web server, can I verify if this is Windows Server Standard or data, or data Center Edition, or how much memory is on this box, or um, if a data disk is available in a storage array, something like that. Anything that you might want to validate before you go do that work that didn't really exist before. And there's many more examples of these. These are the ones that were the big ones that really stand out. Um, if you go to the repo, which we're going to spend uh, the next probably 15 to 20 minutes in, um, it's just github.com slash powershell slash DSC. It is completely public. Uh, as is the issues list that contains all of the work that's in flight and a lot of discussion happening um, with, with opinions that we welcome to, to express why we should or should not um, make decisions or, or go different directions. So um, let's start with schemas. So I am going to hopefully see if my other browser tab that I brought over I don't know for sure that it would go to this browser, and I don't want it to clobber my gather session. Um, so within the DSC repo, I've obviously jumped into a file. If you go into the schemas folder, and then let's go into 2024, um, and I've gone directly into config, but you'll see there's schema definitions for a lot of things within here. Um, including um, configs that are, or, sorry, schema that's in process versus what's bundled and kind of gets um, stashed into the build and that kind of stuff. So what we're looking at is the schema for a configuration as it was last updated in April. I think Mikey has made changes since then, but it's probably in a different folder. Um, that's okay. I just wanted to focus on what would you find here and why would you care? So just like if you were writing a PowerShell script against a, a REST API and you were trying to figure out how do I call get and retrieve information about this specific type, you can navigate these schema files in basically the same way. Um, another way to think about it is if you've ever gone out and looked at something that's still just a REST endpoint, but the ARM schemas for Azure Resource Manager, you're going to see some consistency between, uh, hopefully, between um, what you would see in something like ARM and what you're seeing here. So as I scroll down, this is a pretty short schema file, and this should look very consistent if you've ever written an ARM JSON deployment. Um, and if you're thinking, well, I actually prefer Bicep, that's cool. Hold on to that. We'll think. We'll talk about that some more. Um, but the idea is you can refer to a parameters file and have information. Like you can, if you've thought about environment data in the past with DSC, um, where you were kicking information out to a separate file that you managed as data and then having a config that consumed that, parameters can work a lot that way. Variables, you would work the same way as if you were building an ARM template. So um, if you just have information that you want to reuse throughout your document, um, variables are exactly what they sound like. And then, of course, we get into resources. So just like there's resources in your ARM template, your Azure Resource Manager template in Azure, and there's DSC resources. Microsoft has this like sort of limited vocabulary. We're always like reusing the same terms. Um, so resources is something that gets used a lot everywhere, but in this case it's talking about DSC resources. And you can see within that config, you're going to define an array of resources. And they have a um, the nice thing about a schema is this can be fed into something like a VS Code extension so that when you're authoring 
it knows actually it's not even an extension for them. I mean, it would just be the JSON extension. Um, so whenever you're creating something like a JSON file, it knows if you hit control space to tell you, oh, you need a title, you need a description, you need um, to create items, and then you know, the items depend upon the resource, things like that. So um, the whole intent here is to make this a good developer experience. Um, you should be able to go into a platform that can uh, take a JSON schema and enumerate IntelliSense and help with your authoring. And that as this evolves and continues to evolve down the road and changes happen, they just get updated in the schema and then your IntelliSense continues to evolve along with it as features are introduced. So if you go through these, you'll find the schema for resources. Hope if I hit plus. Um, for the output, there's the resource manifest. I'm going to save that one for now. Um, you get the idea. The, the really important takeaway from that is when you start going out to the GitHub repo, instead of trying to jump right into the command line, first go through that schemas folder and just poke around and look at the different types, look at the properties and how they're defined, and that will help you to kind of set an expectation for how do, how do each of these things sort of relate to each other? Um, so let's go on and look at a new config. Uh, actually, I want to make this an example resource, so I'm just going to fix that slide in real time. So let's look at how would we use an existing PowerShell resource. Before I do that, just like I was saying, let's go look at a resource manifest, and then we'll go look at um, an implemented resource manifest. So this is the schema for a resource manifest. So this is saying um, what to expect. Actually, this is an example. Let's go to this folder and manifest.json. Great. Okay, here is the actual schema for a manifest, um, for a resource manifest. So the idea is a resource has a version description. Um, you can apply tags, which will help a lot in the future for searching. So one of the big questions I get all the time is like, how do I find the resource that does foo? And we're like, oh, well, that's in PSDSE resources now. Like, how do I find the one that does a remote file copy? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's in, that's in PSDSE resources now. That's where we put it. Might be in computer management DSC, though. Check both. People are like, are you crazy? I'm not an expert at this. Why are you pointing me at these crazy names? So the whole idea is we should be able to start doing tags. We should be able to have um, information that helps people find what they're looking for. And then, of course, you'll have the operations. Holy cow, look at all these operations. So it's not just get, set, and test. We're formalizing the concept of doing a what if, which would mean bring the concept of what if to DSC. What if I made this a web server? What would happen? Um, the concept of delete. Um, because in some in some resources that actually does make sense uh, the concept of exports so if you've looked at something like uh, m365 dsc or the reverse dsc project for a long time people like nick Shabra have been looking at can i take something like a sharepoint environment and clone it what would that take well you're going to have to know what to export um, that was a very quick learning uh, that Nick came up with. So you can't just say export the registry. That will not, I mean, you could try, but it's going to run all day long and the information is not going to be very valuable. But you could do something like export the list of applications I have installed. Well, that's a manageable thing. So what would that look like? Well, you're going to have to have a resource that's designed to support something like that. So what Nick did for SharePoint, he created the fourth function which was get, set, test, and I think he called it export. But the idea was uh, if I know how to collect the details about something like a SQL environment or a SharePoint site, why can't I collect that just by saying go get my list of sites or my list of whatever. Um, the example I gave earlier was apps. So go, go get the list of apps. So it has to be, there has to be a function that designs, that's designed to know that because you're not going to provide it with information that says, like if you did a get operation, you say get information about this app I have installed called FUBAR. If you do exports for apps, it's almost like a list operation. Go get everything that's known for this app type. And so the reason that 
export became its own thing. Um, whenever we do a DSC resource list operation here in a little bit, you'll see that each of these capabilities is exposed, and you'll be able to see in the command line what they support and how to do it. Um, you get the rest of the, for some of these, they make sense uh, just by looking at them. So, uh, you know, can you perform a validation that, it, that it's going to work the way it says it will? Forget what Steve has in mind for resolve. I, um, It'd be going from complex to simple, but I don't remember the details. Uh, adapter is what we're going to look at here in just a minute. And then you see the definition of exit codes. Um, so for a DSC resource, being able to actually produce meaningful errors and explain why, if it failed, why it failed. Uh, and then you get to basic chase on information. So let's go look at how this would work for an existing resource. So you are looking at a config, and this configuration is written in YAML. Right now, you can write resource, you can write configurations in YAML or in JSON. Um, if you are storing them programmatically, JSON is a good way to do it. If you want it to be human readable, in many opinions, YAML is more human readable. <laughs> in many people's opinion, um, and we're looking at additional. Uh, domain-specific languages, uh, which we'll talk about after a while. So in this, idea, in this, if you think back to the schema file we're looking at for configs, which should be referenced right here at the top, so that's what would tell your editor how it can validate what, you've, what you're editing here. Um, there's your array of resources, and in this example, we've given it a name. It's going to be a, a class-based resource from DSC v2. Um, the type is Microsoft.dsc slash PowerShell. What this means is that there is an adapter resource that knows how to do things. That's different than, and, and, and as an end user, you don't have to think about this, other than resources is declared again inside of this thing. But before we talk about that, um, Steve has implemented a native code registry resource. So what's the difference? Well, in the Microsoft.windows slash registry resource, he's written like a binary command line option for working with the registry where you can get set test and other operations for the registry directly from the command line. So there, those properties like what's the path to the key, what value do I want to set, should it be created or deleted, things like that, um, is all tucked right there under properties. And that's because we're consuming the Microsoft.windows slash registry resource. You'll see up here, I'm calling out to the module name as type PS desired state configuration Microsoft service resource. So that is the same PS desired state configuration Microsoft service resource uh, that you saw that shipped with DSC v1 and v2 and is there today. Um, so here's the one for the user resource and you're providing information that. So what's the difference? The Microsoft.dsc slash PowerShell resource is an adapter that knows how to call something else. So this was, and if I go look back at the schemas, this is what we are talking about earlier. Actually, this might be more interesting for this group. Let me look directly at... should be under resources. Nope, it's up under source. Oh, PowerShell adapter. Why this is in a separate folder, I don't know. Uh, great. So you'll see obviously it has a, prop, a top level property named adapter. Um, the concept of an adapter is why can't we just have a JSON file? Well, let's actually go back one more level. If we're going to call DSC and tell it to do something, today in DSC, it's going to look, and, and well, if, it's just going to look at the schema.moff and understand from WMI how to execute things, but um, from the data model. But um, why can't we decouple what it's going to run? and how it's going to run it. So instead of saying everything has to be in PowerShell, uh, what if we just had a JSON manifest that said for the type 
Windows PowerShell, how would you run get? Well, the way you run get is you run PowerShell.exe and you pass it these arguments and then we're going to give it a script, PowerShell.resource.ps1, that implements these things and we're going to call it a parameter to pass in the word get, which, which tells it to go run a get function. Same thing for set, invoke PowerShell. Here's a script that knows how to do that. Same for tests, same for validate. You get the idea. So if we were to go dig in and see what that looks like, it'll probably be more confusing than what we really want to spend time on today. Um, um, let, let's let our imagination run wild on this thing. So what if I want to have Python resources? Well, I could do a Python adapter. So I could do executable Python, and I'm going to call you know resource.py and pass it in get, set, and test. What if I want to have a, I, mean, I don't know why somebody would do this, but what if you wanted to have a resource that's based on cmd.exe or an adapter so that, so that you can write resources in cmd. You can have bat file resources if you want to. I don't know why you would. Um, so your, your executable would be cmd.exe. You'd pass in the arguments. You would have a bat file that accepts get, and it could go do things as a resource. I don't think anybody will do bat files. I do think probably people will do bash. I bet you that Bash becomes an adapter. Um, I bet that Python becomes an adapter. If you want to do a Go adapter, if you wanted to do an, an adapter in Node.js, um, these things are completely decoupled. And the difference you'll see under PSDSC adapter here, uh, we have separate for Windows PowerShell, that's why it's calling PowerShell.exe, versus PowerShell, which is calling PWSH. Why did I drag you through this? So let's go look again at something from my slides. This is an example that's using the script resource. And Gail's going, yes. So the script resource was originally released uh, really as a learning utility, and it's used freaking everywhere. Um, the whole idea was in PowerShell v1 and v2, like, let's have a, a getting started hello world thing that's super easy to learn. So in your configuration um, as input, just tell us what you want us to run for get, set, and test, and that'll be the resource. So your configuration is, you can be done and, and off into the races in like five minutes and you're good. And then, of course, everybody who didn't want to go develop their own resources said, cool, I'll just use that. Well, it became very unwieldy and difficult to test, and the community gets upset whenever they see the script resource. The reason I put this in the slide deck was to call out, this is using the adapter, Microsoft.Windows PowerShell, because the idea is it's calling the Windows PowerShell that shipped in Windows. So it's Microsoft.Windows, and it's got a name, it's got properties, and then there's the resources. It's telling it to go use the script resource, and then it's passing in those parameters in YAML. That means there's no compatibility concerns that we've found so far. So between DSC v3 and v1 or v2, when people got to v2 and we were really pushing everybody to go towards class-based resources and providing examples, things like that, people were like, I don't want to learn classes. Fair enough. So if you are using something that is best off running in like WMF 5.1, PowerShell 5.1, PowerShell.exe, it was written for that. You've tested it there. You know it works there. You can just use the Windows PowerShell adapter within your configuration. If you want it to use class-based and you want to use PowerShell 7 in your scripts and you're using the latest and greatest, you could use the Microsoft.dsc slash PowerShell adapter. And in the same config, you could have a call to the Windows PowerShell adapter and then a call to the PowerShell adapter, go back and forth, call a native code one, it's completely decoupled. So we think we've got compatibility with old, not old, with existing, the ginormous existing library of community um, contributions. We think we should have full compatibility right up, like just from the very beginning. I hate when people say from the get-go. So from the very beginning, um, you should have full compatibility with existing resources. Now, what we won't have, full disclosure, uh, there has been a community contribution on a tool to start working on converting from existing config scripts that are written in PowerShell and getting them to the new format. Because you can you know, take the configuration, load it, look at the schema, build it out, things like that. Um, but right now, configurations are in 
uh, JSON or YAML, and you can pass that directly into DSC.exe and, and use those at the command line. Um, and I guess before I move completely over away from configurations, uh, since we've only got you know 10 to 20 minutes left, um, the work is just beginning right now on using BICEP as a language. And so the whole idea there is you should be able to do something like, oh, I don't know if I can go in here. Sure. Um, let's say that you want to install a package. People can say, oh, we can get on Windows Server. But um, the idea is we can find a better one in here, but something that can happen on a server uh, that you could say, I want to define what I, how I want my server built in BICEP. I should be able to take my web server.bicep, pipe that to dsc.exe, config set, and it builds my web server. And then down the road, whenever we've got future work in Azure where we could consume something like that, then we should be able to just take that and test it locally and then run it on your servers at deployment time and um, have a continuous build process, have a continuous test process, be able to, to just author things in a familiar language and then snap them into the cloud uh, deployment as opposed to having to, okay, well, I got this configuration and then I got to like create a zip file and put that in blob storage and figure out how it's going to access blob storage because that, you know, build script is running as an app ID and all this kind of stuff. We, the goal is to make these things um, so that one goes into another. And so that's why we're uh, beginning work now to be able to do exactly what you see on the screen, but uh, through a, a, a language extension for BICEP, which would be pretty cool. Let me go on to the last couple of slides here. So uh, we talked about uh, building a resource as an adapter, and I mentioned you could do it as a command. I wanted to show that uh, registry resource real quick for the for everyone who's on the call who's like a hardcore developer and um, likes to go develop, you know, command line tools. Um, this is an example of a resource that knows how to get information about processes. And the whole idea is that executable would be the word process. And then the argument would be get. This is like where we would love to get to with DSC, right? The idea is um, more and more like, like, like the way I think about this is the AZ CLI syntax. Let's not get back and forth into AZ CLI and AZ PowerShell yet, but like AZ CLI, that syntax is AZ VM create. Wouldn't that be nice if everything was just that simple? Like if you could just say, uh, win registry create something like that would be really nice. So if we can sort of get developers thinking that way, I'm going to build an app. Cool create the ability to configure your app from the command line as part of your app. And then something like this, or quite frankly, Ansible or whoever wants to build on top of that has a very predictable pattern that they can build on top of. And they can just cleanly say uh, for something like, let's go look here at registry. And the nice thing is you can always just go look at the JSON to see exactly how it works. Call the registry.exe executable. He's just calling it registry because he'd put it in the path. Uh, pass in config get and how you want your arguments to flow. And you're one JSON file away from your executable becoming a resource. And there actually were sessions. I know at uh, the PowerShell Summit US, I think also at PSConf EU this year um, that are recorded where people from the community are already playing with, oh, cool. Well, I can go build a command line tool that makes some task easier and I sort of like get the DSC resource for free if I just add a JSON file. Uh, so that way of thinking is evolving and it's it's actually really fun to watch. Um, to look real quickly at groups. So why in the world would you want to group resources? Well, don't ask me that after 10 years of discussions about partial configurations and composite resources and even the undocumented composite configurations. Uh, the idea of a group is within your configuration, you could say, let's find a better example here. First group, nested group, list, last group. Okay, first group, last group. Let's interpret it that way. Um, here in this test example, it's saying, uh, go back. 
Well, this is not the best example I could have found because it's it's doing an echo first. <laughs> but the idea would be um, take things that you want to happen and you can do one, these five happen and then these three. If anything goes wrong in those first five, um, handle that in a different way before you go on to verse three. You can do nested groups uh, and you can do output. So you can do an output from a resource or you can do an output from a group. And the idea is, um, I don't see it in this example, so I'm just going to explain it. Uh, you see how in this depends on, it's referring to that first group. In the same way, if your, if your second group had something that was input, like for echo, you know, what do you want it to, to output? Um, this could actually be a reference to something like this. So you can say, I want this to happen, this to happen, this to happen, and then I want to output. You could do within that group, I want to have the second one refer to the, something that happened in the first and so on and so forth, and then take that as a collective and send that as an output for the group and then have another group take over and have it accept, have, have it refer to that output. So it's now accepting input. And you can imagine how these things get tied together. Um, we've, we've tried to think through some really complex scenarios that are sort of like edge cases where people get stuck. Um, and what we basically, in, in, um, in the issues list, you'll see this quite a bit, where somebody will say, well, how would you do this? Mikey, I think, coined the phrase, anytime a new idea comes up, let's first see if we can do it with a group or an adapter. If we can't, it should be a feature. But like 95% of the time, a group or an adapter solved the problem or a combination of the two. So that's been kind of interesting. It just adds a lot of flexibility for how you organize your configuration. Um, and then as we start working on things like... Uh, doing embeddings and that kind of stuff, m making them modular. Uh, then you could get into, well, what if there's three, what if the security team contributes to this group, but then the app owner contributes to this group, but you want to bring them together at build time and do validation across the board. That kind of stuff becomes super, super interesting. And last slide. And then we'll take a quick look at some of the, um, just a brief look at the command line tool and how to do a build. Uh, so assertions is a new, completely new concept for DSC. Uh, the idea of an assertion is what I call a pre-flight check. So the idea here was to show an example of go and um, make sure it's a Windows machine before you go try to look up something in the registry because the registry resource, maybe you're trying to have one configuration that spans environments. Um, and the registry resource is not going to work on Linux. I haven't seen too many configurations that actually span operating systems, but there's a million things that assertions could be used for. Uh, the time zone, the locale, the amount of free space on disk, the amount of memory, the number of processors. Is this virtual or is this physical? Is this in the cloud or is this local? Uh, anything that you can imagine you might want to go get a true false answer before you move on to actually having a resource in the past people did this by sort of like putting set just not do anything so the idea was like i can have a configuration and if i just want to do a check i can have test run first and check to see if it's true or false and if it's false then i do a depends on relationship and i fail the whole thing but you know false was going to trigger test so now i have like an empty test an empty set operation uh, and all that kind of stuff within that method, and it was just messy. So the idea of an assertion is, uh, it's like audit only. It's it's like saying, go check and make sure that this environment is what I think it is before I start making changes. And then, of course, you could do conditions within um, certain environments and say, well, based on what I got back from the assertion, I might want a limited different set of behaviors. You don't want to go crazy by having a decision tree, uh, but you might do something small and say, I want to tweak exactly, you know, where I put my data depending on how many data, uh, the, the number of volumes that are available or, or you know, create your favorite um, obstacle that you've run into in the past. So uh, as you go through the repo, if you go into the folder DSC and then examples, you'll see a whole bunch of different examples in here that are used in um, tests that run 
uh, on the build server and you can start playing around and just kind of looking through and, and looking for changes and seeing if new ones have been introduced. Uh, obviously, the idea of run in parallel. We talked about that a little bit at PowerShell Summit. Um, and then I created an issue based on that conversation. Uh, should we just like default to parallel and then say whenever it's not parallel? Um, and what we really came in, the, the, the issue uh, ran into was um, parallel works really well in something like Azure that's designed as a deployment engine that's saying, you go create a storage account, you go create a network. But in Windows and a VM that has, you know, sort of like restricted, not restricted, but a set amount of uh, performance available in terms of memory and processor and, and disk uh, IO. Um, how much do you want to bet on it being able to run in parallel for everything? Uh, so the idea is Steve has built out a parallel group concept that you see here, which whenever you know for sure that things work, as a parallel operation, you can group them and say, run these things in parallel. And when that's done, go run these uh, uh, not parallel. And that's a good example of that philosophy of, well, can we have this work as a group resource that has some additional capabilities um, as opposed to creating a, a like entire new type of feature. Okay, that goes through a lot of details of what's going on in the repo and things that you're seeing evolving. Um, before I do the command line, um, I do want to just, like, how do we see this evolving? Um, so this is in the docs now. Uh, this is out in the V1 docs and might look familiar, but the idea was what would this look like in a pipeline, especially in the real world where you've got multiple people contributing? Um, so you might have uh, a source control repo that's owned by the application owner. You might have other teams that come along and say, we need to contribute something. And depending on how your, config your server configurations are defined, you might say anything from, I want to push the latest updates to uh, we're getting a new version of some middleware concept. Um, we're we, you know we're rolling out the latest we're, we're rolling out .NET 8 or .NET 9 whenever it's available and um, we want to make sure that your server can take this so we're going to go ahead and check that into your source control well we're going to submit a PR and and let the build run to see if your server will like .NET 9 or not uh, so you know that PR as it hits source control is going to kick off a build. The build's going to run um, things like script analyzer against your PowerShell resources, uh, and hopefully in the in the future we'll have. I mean, there's examples in the repo already. Pester tests to go out and evaluate uh, your configurations, your resources, make sure everything makes sense. Start doing actual uh, integration tests, spin up a VM, make sure things don't fall over. So your your tests all get executed, and then actually have a release um, that you know possibly requires someone to go in and do multi-factor authentication to say, yep, go ahead and release this. Um, everything looks good in the QA environment. Let's go to prod, et cetera. Uh, that might release it directly onto a server, which we'll talk a little bit about here in a second. Or in the future, we hope that this thing will start showing up in platforms like Azure Machine Configuration. And that's where I was saying, I'm looking forward to the future where uh, platforms like Machine Configuration that already support BICEP to define multiple configuration assignments to servers and all that kind of stuff and do reporting through resource graph. If we can just take bicep to bicep, that'll be really clean and nice. And that's where I'm hoping things will end up. Um, in the meantime, let's take a quick look at the command line because also what could happen is something like your, uh, you know, GitHub actions build agent might run DSC locally on the machine. So I should have a good, let's go. Oh, no, let's see here. Why that didn't resolve, I don't know. Uh, I should have it right here, I guess. What folder am I in? Okay, fine. Um, so I have cloned the DSC repo to my machine. Let me go back two levels and I should have done a put pop. Um, if you just run build.ps1 on your machine, I'm not going to do it because it will take over the rest of our available time. Uh, if you've cloned this repo and you run build.ps1, I've never had it not work. <laughs> so Steve's doing a great job there. Um, and so the idea is it's going to 
um, bring the tools necessary to do a Rust compila a compilation and then the, the language Rust um, on your machine. And in the end, within the bin folder and then debug, you will have a DSC.exe file. Um, and so you can really just start playing around with this concept. Um, you can generate the completers if you want to have a uh, tab completion within PowerShell. Um, if you do a uh, DSC help, boy, that's going to get real old real fast. Um, you get this, and then if I say DSC fig help, then I can start poking around at the help uh, content within each different operation. So you get the idea here, and you can imagine I should have something in now. How about oh, there it is. Great, perfect. Um, the idea of just passing in that. Good work if I added that to my path. That would be a lot handier. So I don't know if this one will work. It probably won't because there's a typo right here. It's not Microsoft.dsc anymore. It's Microsoft.windows. Uh, the, the test that I was running whenever I had this open originally was... Let me just kill this and fix that, otherwise that won't work. Uh, will the original file resource work with DSCB3? I don't know why this is... I have a build that has a bug that's about three weeks old, and enumerating the list of local resources might take a while. We probably don't want to wait. Um, but the idea was, it might, this may be coming from your build server. Yep. Uh, this is just the JSON string. So it's looking for PS Desire State Configuration file. That is literally the one that shipped WMF4, probably, was the first time that that shipped. Uh, it's the binary resource for file. And it's just passing to dsc.exe. It knows what to do with that JSON. Um, and you do a get operation. It's not a very good example for config, but that's where I started. Uh, you get the idea. So I would have my JSON. I'm just going to put a placeholder so you get so we can do the quick example here. Um, this is going to freak out clearly. Uh, let's say I did a. Yeah, it's clearly not going to, like, a bracket just right in the middle of nothing. Don't have help yet for set. Uh, oh, if, so this is actually something I'm still getting used to, but the help is going to dsc.exe not to set. Uh, I guess I need to send it to config. And then what if I send it to set now? That looks better. Uh, so for the set operation, I can point it to a document. I can point it to the path for the document. Uh, I can output the result of get, set, or test, or export to JSON string, to a nice, pretty formatted JSON, or to YAML. I can do a what if, and then this operation. Um, that's a pretty consistent flow. So you would be looking at, I'm going to create my configuration or I'm going to get the details that are flowing into a resource because you can still, the same way you can do invoke DSC resource, you can do something like DSC resource and then set and get, and you just give it the specific resource name as you pass in parameters. Um, so if I look at just that one example and then I will just do Q&A because we're way over on time. If I pass help to a resource operation, um, it's very similar. What resource input? Uh, and I guess the last one I would do is resource, DSC resource list. Oh. Uh, 
just to show that the the evolution here of the caps or the capabilities. Um, so you, this would be what would come with the builds. I'm not in so I would have to tell it to enumerate. Um, if I if I tell it to use the Windows PowerShell adapter, then I would also get the list of inbox resources. Uh, but one of the cool things here is you can see the capabilities in a table. So they all support get in this list. S means that they also support set, which means some of these are basically just audit, like for a pending reboot. That only does get, so it's only good for an audit. Um, T for test, E for exports. Yeah, this got me at PowerShell Summit to W and D. I have to go back and look up what they are. Um, so that's a very quick walkthrough of the uh, command line. But the um, for DSCB3, I just wanted to finish on kind of like where things are at. So uh, you can already start to see this in the issues list. Um, but working very closely with Winget, working very closely with some partners in the uh, developer organization, trying to understand where we can have this be very, uh, very, have a, have a close relationship um, with, with developer tools, with the operating system, uh, and, and really to really come back to a point that Alexander was making in the very beginning. He keeps saying, why, why would you even call this DSC? Like, this is so different then desired state configuration has always been in PowerShell. And I think in our expert community as a platform, we'll look at it as DSC and keep developing it that way. But I think and expect to see DSC showing up in all kinds of different solutions. And in those cases, the people who are using it won't even know they're using DSC. So a good example of that, if you uh, just search the docs and look for Dev Home, which is part of Windows 11, you can install the Dev Home app. You can start using um, the Dev Home as a tool. Uh, you can actually tell it to go install like VS Code and different things, and you can tell it, now save what I've done here so that I can um, actually check it into a repo. And the whole idea here is like, oh, I'm... Um, I have a VM and I want to, or maybe for my workstation, uh, I'm looking at a the source code for a project. I want to use the same tools that the original authors used as I'm working on it. The project can actually check in a YAML file and Dev Home can take that YAML file and figure out how to call Winget and even some uh, configuration options, say like what extensions you want in VS Code and things like that. And you can link setting up your workstation to a source control repository. So that's already documented um, and out in the docs, but you'll see more of those things start to like, continue to grow. Um, but I think this concept of like, oh, people don't even realize that's DSC. I think that's going to stick. Like, I think that's one thing that we'll see more and more of. People in the future, you know, oh, my server in Azure got configured, you know, or the, it audited the baseline or it applied a baseline. You know, I don't know how to use DSC. I just know how to do these things. I think we'll see more of that, which is uh, taking these tools that are uh, expert level operational skills and have them obfuscated away into solutions. Uh, so let me check. We're way over on time, but uh, use the same schema and settings.json file for resource authoring. I, if I understand the question, I would say yeah. Um, with powershell.dsc.yaml example, should the registry property not be exist? Uh, yes. And that is an example of things that have been evolving. Like there was a long discussion thread in the issues list about um, did, should we keep using the phrase ensure? Do people even understand what ensure means? Like that sort of like came with DSC. Maybe the concept of it should exist or not exist is easier for people to understand and then um, what you'll see in that example is anything that has an underscore means that it is a property name um, that is global so like if you see underscore exists uh, it means that would be built into dsc it would be available for all for all resources um, and doesn't have to be explicitly declared one of the things that steve has done that's very very cool is the the concept of a resource manifest um, is very dynamic. You technically could get away, I shouldn't even talk about this because it's going to be like another script resource, but you technically could get away with 
uh, not having an, a full resource manifest because you can tell it, uh, I have an implemented test. So go run get, compare the output of get to the input from my parameters. If those things match, test is true. If they don't, test is false. There's some concepts like that evolving to try to simplify the ability uh, to really adapt to uh, advanced feature sets for existing resources as easily as possible, but also just make resource authoring as easy as possible. Um, so with that, thank you very much. We're over on time. Is there anything else? Oh, W should be what if, and D, I just saw it, and then it scrolled. D's delete. Yep. Yes. The, yep, yep, yep. You got it exactly on the, the example um, for referring to being able to do things from the source control. Use the new DSC PowerShell adapter and their resource to start a process in session one without using scheduled task trickery. So uh, one of the two of the properties that are interesting in that respect for resources, one is um, do you, like, do you expect this, I remember the names of them, but it's like, do you expect it to run as system or as a user? And then the other is, do you expect it to run elevated or not? And you can have conditions change based on, um, obviously, you can have uh, DSC handle the elevation, and then also um, things can behave differently based on if, if you're elevated or not. Um, so those are properties that you can have uh, in your configuration as you describe how a resource is going to run. And this concept of running DSC in the user context to like install applications is really interesting. There, there's been a few people I know of who have done that successfully in the past, but uh, I think it's really exciting because there's a whole other set of resources don't, that don't even exist today that could be built out, you know, setting your wallpaper background or whatever. Um, so all, all kinds of new uh, surface area there that we can get into. Uh, I'm missing two key steps there is there a credential support working on it and the idea is um, secrets rather than doing something within uh, rust the idea is they would pull from either secrets management or key vault or something designed to store secrets uh, but the ability uh, after that is really just secure strings except there are a bunch of resources out there that expect credential objects as inputs. For that to work, we're basically going to have to do something that's like a, a wrapper of some kind that tells JSON, um, here's a username password or a user, a username and a reference to a password that becomes a credential when it's passed to the resource. And there's an open issue for that. Uh, DSC didn't support interact application in the configuration. Yep. Got it. Okay, cool. I think that's it. I will hit stop sharing on the on the right monitor. <laughs>